There are now more ETFs than stocks in the United States. And the paradox of choice says the more choices you have, the tougher it is to make a choice. And the more likely you are to second guess your decision later. So today we're going to help you pick the best biotech ETF. And it's way more complicated than I would have ever thought. So let's dig in. Morningstar did an often quoted study that says the number one predictor of a fund's performance is the expense ratio. That's how much you're being charged to the fund. Well, duh, Joe. The more you give Wall Street, the less you give yourself. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's all rather obvious to you, Rain Man. But think about how dumb the average person is, and then realize that half of them are dumber than that, said the great American philosopher, George Carlin. But in addition to fees, you need to consider what exposure you're actually getting. What companies are you investing in with a fund or ETF? And in the biotech world, this can be extremely tough to define as we're going to learn today. When we're looking to find a list of ETFs for a particular theme, we like to use a firm called Vetify. They're consistently useful for this sort of thing. So here's a list of the largest biotech ETFs by assets under management, or what they refer to as AUM. We can then start to refine this a bit. So first of all, larger ETFs are preferable to smaller ones, mainly because the larger an ETF is, the lower the expense ratio they can charge, the less you have to pay Wall Street. And in this case, we start going down the list. We see the two largest names here, IBB and XBI. Both have around $6 billion in AUM. Third on the list is ARK's Genomic Revolution ETF, and this is an actively managed ETF. That means that ARK's managers are trying to beat a benchmark. For the other two large ETFs here I just mentioned, they are trying to match the performance of a benchmark, so they are simply being passively managed. Actively managed funds not only charge a whole lot more, but 95% of active managers can't beat their benchmark in the long term. So you don't want to pay more and get less. So we're primarily interested in passively managed ETFs. Then we continue going down the list. We see names like the Direction Daily S&P Biotech Bull, three-time leveraged ETF. Anything leveraged is a horrible idea. Joe Retail thinks that means he's getting three times the performance of the index, when in fact, it's a lot more complicated than that, and we covered that in a past piece. So you're best not dabbling in those sorts of vehicles, which charge a very hefty expense ratio, as you can see here. So 93 basis points for that leveraged ETF. But when we look at the top two that we have our eye on, so you have 44 basis points and 35 basis points. Then ARC, as I said, actively manage 75 basis points. To put this into perspective, every 1% that you're charged in expense ratio, what we would say 100 basis points over the lifetime of an investment, translates into having 30% less money as a rule of thumb. That's not only because you're giving that money to somebody else instead of holding it, but you're also not realizing a return on that money that you're giving to somebody else that you could be if you held that money instead. Then at the bottom of the list, we have this Vanek Biotech ETF. So it has relatively small assets under management. So that would sort of be off our radar, though it charges a relatively low expense ratio compared to the other names on this list. So let's look at those top two names closer. We have XBI, as I said, in IBB. The first thing that you're going to notice here is that for the top 10 constituents for ETFs, there's quite a different weighting. So for XBI, the top 10 are less than 20% of the total ETF weighting. For IBB, they're nearly half. The other thing to note here is just how dramatically different the constituents or the members of these ETFs are. The only two names in common here you can see are Vertex and Insmed, and they have dramatically different weightings between these two ETFs. Now, in order to explain these differences, it always comes down to the under underlying indices that they're tracking. And to better understand that, I wanted to show you this diagram. It's called the Global Industry Classification Standard, or GICS. MSCI and Standard & Poor's came up with this in 1999, and it's been widely adopted across industry, along with a few other classification standards we'll discuss later. But biotech companies are going to be found in this top-level sector, which is healthcare. That's where we're going to want to probe, and what we can then do is expand that out and it goes three levels deep. This is how GIX is structured. At the top level, you have healthcare, then you start going down and you see, wow, there's actually
actually a segment here called biotechnology. Now, it's not as simple as finding an ETF that tracks that segment because oftentimes there won't be enough constituents or the ETF or fund provider thinks that that alone isn't sufficient. For example, here under life sciences, tools and services, there are probably a number of companies that ought to be included in a biotech ETF or fund. So the other thing that you would immediately want to consider here would be why not just invest at a much higher level? This depends on your thesis. Now you're watching this video because you want to invest in biotech, but do you want to invest in biotech or healthcare? Because if you want to invest in healthcare, then you would start at the top there and there are numerous ETF providers that offer that sort of exposure very cheap. More commonly cited VHT, you see that talked about a lot. Vanguard's offering, then you have XLV, Spider's offering. Lots of assets under management compared to the biotech ETFs. We're looking at IBB and XBI, which are also on this list. So this is simply asking Vetify to expand its scope and not just focus on biotechnology. You see they also turned up a medical devices ETF. And when you look at the expense ratios, that's the acronym there, ER, for these healthcare ETFs, under 10 basis points. I would always say that at the sector level and at any level that's very broad, you shouldn't pay more than 10 basis points. And typically Vanguard has ETFs on offer that will give you that sort of exposure for very cheap. And when you look at this sort of exposure you're getting from these healthcare ETFs, at that broad level, you would expect them to be very similar. Look, indeed they are. So the top 10 holdings, you know, slightly different weightings there. But when you look at the constituents, the companies that each ETF holds, everything is pretty much common except you get some different names. So you see Boston Scientific is in one whilst Pfizer is in the other. And that's largely because both of these ETFs are based on the GIX classification standard, even though the underlying indices are different. So when we think about the two biotech ETFs that we're looking at today, the NYSE put out some great pieces that talk about biotech and life sciences indices and sort of describe why they're so dramatically different. Here they mention how ICE has three biotech indices tracked by about $10 billion. Now this is back in 2023, so this information is a bit dated, but it's still relevant and the themes still hold. You have the NASDAQ biotech index, which is largely used by active managers, right, like ARC, so they can say, look, we were able to beat this index and show outperformance, though few will in time frames measured in decades, as I said. Then you have the S&P Biotech Index. They say each index has its own methodologies and rules leading to significant differences. We just saw that, right? And they mention performance. They say over the long haul, ICE Bio consistently ranks on top for three, five, and 10 year periods. Be very careful about taking into, and this is very common for Joe Retail to do, taking performance as a main factor when you're trying to select a fund or index because, as you know, as they say, past performance is no indication of future results. So we typically don't consider that in selecting a fund or an ETF or an index. As we know, underneath the covers, these are very different indices. Both contain no pharmaceutical companies. So this tells you that at least two subject matter experts believe that the definition of biotech shouldn't contain pharma. So you might want to consider that when you're thinking about this exposure. So if you wanted to include pharma, I'm sure there's a pharma ETF out there. You could add that to the mix or you could just invest at the healthcare level and pay a lot less. Now, SP Bio is limited to U.S. companies while ICE Bio isn't. That's interesting, right? And perhaps the most notable fact when explaining the differences between these two would be that ICE bio constituents are market cap weighted, which is typically how index providers weight an index. So the larger companies have larger representation, whilst SP bio constituents are equally weighted. When you do that, you're overweighting small caps, right? Because you're reducing the weighting of large caps. That gives SP bio a higher exposure to small cap names. Now, counterintuitively, SP Bio actually has significantly fewer constituents, but it's less concentrated because of that equal weighting scheme. So going back to look at those two ETFs we see here, the XBI ETF running on SP Bio, the IBB ETF running on ICE Bio, right? And when we further dig into these indices, you see here for SP Bio, they're simply looking at two GIX classifications here, biotechnology and life sciences, tools and services, and they're just focused on the constituents within those two classifications. That's very straightforward, very easy to understand.
Now, when it comes to the other index, the ICE Biotechnology Index, those, they say, are defined as companies which are classified within the biotechnology sub-industry group of the ICE Uniform Sector Classification Scheme. So this is not using GICs. This is using an entirely different classification method. There are some other lesser used classification standards out there, such as one provided by Thomson Reuters, or you have the SICK classification used by the U.S. government, which is all rather convoluted. So anyways, the other thing to pay attention to here when we look at ICB is that they actually switched up their underlying index back in 2021. That starts to make things a whole lot tricky, especially when you're looking at performance. Oftentimes, a funder ETF will switch their index provider because they find somebody cheaper. It more appropriately aligns with the fund manager's goals. So that is just something noting here. So we have these two biotech ETFs, XBI versus IBB. We sort of go down here with some rudimentary criteria we can use to try to choose one. Regarding the two different industry classification standards we talked about, I'm more biased towards GICs because I worked at MSCI for over a decade and I spent a lot of time using that classification standard and monitoring how it changed over time. So I would put XBI as the front runner there because of that bias. But then you have weighting differences. So we generally prefer market cap weighted because that lets the winners run and it also gives us more exposure to larger companies, and we believe larger companies generally outperform because they enjoy things like economies of scale. And of course, market cap weighting is the most prevalent approach taken by index providers. When it comes to concentration, in the world of disruptive growth investing, we prefer concentrated exposure. We don't necessarily want the benefits of diversification. We'll utilize that at an asset class level. So that would put IBB in front. And then when it comes to fees, XBI, right, that's very simple, is 35 basis points versus 44 basis points. You know, nine basis points is pretty meaningful. So I would probably argue price above all else and lean towards XBI for that reason, even though these two options seem on par in a lot of different ways. The other thing you could consider doing here is simply investing 50% in each, then you don't have to make a choice. Now, when it comes to our own life sciences exposure, that's what we classify these types of holdings versus biotech, though that's a more commonly used name. It's more exciting, right? Our life sciences exposure is really two components. The first would be disruptive growth. These are growth stocks, very high on the growth spectrum. We invest in themes such as long read sequencing, so a company like Oxford Nanopore, cancer blood tests, you know, you've got Gardant, Exact Sciences is dabbling there, Natera. There are quite a few names. We did a piece earlier this year that really dug into that. You have Tempest AI, a recently emerging name that would be a play on healthcare big data. So these are exciting thematic investments that are quite volatile. On the other end of the spectrum, you have perhaps what you might label extreme value, dividend growth stocks. These are firms that have not only paid a dividend, but increased it for at least 25 years in a row. Here I've pulled out a list of the core constituents in that classification. You see here, years increasing dividend. That's very remarkable, right? Johnson & Johnson has not only paid, but increased a dividend for over 63 years. Very remarkable. And here you can see they're all pretty large companies. You have five-year, 10-year dividend growth rate. These are just some of the factors we use to calculate a Q score so that we can start to rank these. I think we've invested in four or five firms here in our 30 stock dividend growth investing portfolio. Now, speaking of dividend growth, the highest ranked stock in our Quantigence universe, it's not seen in this list because I didn't include international firms. The highest ranked name in our entire universe of over 200 dividend growth stocks would be a very contentious pharma firm that we recently covered. It's a very interesting story. It's certainly something you ought to watch next. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.